Warning, this video will contain spoilers up to chapter 1049. You've been warned. Hello, my name is This is Joy Girl. And I want to do something fun. And, well, something that's fun for me at least. Although, if you're a One Piece geek like I am, and let's face it, if you clicked onto this video, yes, you most definitely are most likely a One Piece geek like me. So I suppose this will be fun for you too. But what I want to do is I want to take the time to fill in the missing pieces and the missing details of Kaido's backstory. And I want to use what pieces of detail and information that we do know about his past to try to figure out, you know, what has shaped Kaido into becoming the man we know him to be today. Or I suppose I should say the only man that he is today, or really the only dragon man that he is today. And obviously this discussion has been spurred on by the release of chapter 1049, where we got more and more fragmented bits and pieces of Kaido's backstory, but then not entirely the full picture. And I know that the way in which this backstory has been given to us, you know, in these broken pieces, I know that some people found this quite unsatisfying and I'll have to say for myself as well that I said after reading the chapter, I was very sure that we are going to get more details and we're going to see more of Kaido's backstory being fleshed out, you know, in future chapters. But then in some ways, it's actually quite fitting that this is the way that Oda has revealed so much of Kaido's flashback because it's quite similar to what we have gotten of Kaido's past before. You know, Oda seems to keep divulging more new information and, you know, further bits and pieces to us in these broken, fragmented bits. For example, we saw a portion of Kaido's backstory through the eyes of Odin in Odin's flashback, and then we also saw it through Yamato and how Yamato viewed that portion, that moment within Kaido's story. And then also we saw it through the lens of King and how, you know, King viewed that moment of Kaido's life. And so in saying that, when you also take into account the reveals in chapter 1049, and you start piecing all of these together, although this still leaves some gaps as to Kaido's history, you do still start to see a real story coming along. And so I do dare say that we may have just enough to really start speculating on, you know, Kaido's past, what has shaped him into being the great big oni full of conflicting emotions and the strong ideologies that he seems to have. And you know how all of these moments that we've seen so far throughout this arc, how they all come together and how they all fit together to tell Kaido's story. But something else quite interesting that I found during my rumination of Kaido's history and his past is that it seems like like Oda may have actually dropped some hints earlier in the series about Kaido and about his past that could actually come back and somehow could actually fit into Kaido's timeline. But then speaking of timeline, if you would like to see more One Piece discussions from yours truly pop up onto your YouTube timeline, then I do suggest and highly recommend that you click subscribe to this channel. Now that you have subscribed, we can move on and we can discuss Kaido's timeline. So the earliest piece of information that we get about Kaido now is the fact that we see him when he's 10 years old and we see him already as a super strong soldier. But something really interesting that sticks out almost straight away is in fact that fact that he sticks out. I mean, obviously there's the fact that others are singling him out as the strongest soldier, but even beyond that, we see for ourselves that it seems like Kaido is the only Oni, even though he's surrounded by his fellow soldiers, presumably his fellow countrymen. I mean, he's the only one that we see with Oni horns, and although that could be due to the fact that all the others that we see in that panel are cloaked, and so that maybe their horns were hidden, this seems somewhat unlikely given what we see in the next part of his life that we saw in chapter 1049 where we see Kaido 46 years ago, which would place him at 13 years old. I mean, here it becomes even clearer that Kaido doesn't fit in. I mean, he's huge compared to the rest of them. And so this has me feeling that I'm not fully convinced that that period of his life, seeing Kaido at 10 years old, 
is the earliest part of his backstory that we should be made aware of. I feel like there should be, or there is, a deeper story behind Kaido's life, behind his childhood. You know, answering the fact as to why an Oni is at Vodka Kingdom, where it doesn't seem like he's surrounded by other Onis. And then on this note of Kaido being the sole Oni, or presumably the only Oni, this leads us to the detail that at a very young age, Kaido was traded off to the Marines. You know, a trend action for the super strong, the strongest soldier in exchange for a seat at the next reverie. And this part of his flashback actually explains quite a lot. I mean, based on the dialogue, it seems like Kaido may not have been even interested in fighting wars in the first place. It seems like someone is having to remind him or explain to him why this country is being involved in wars. And their reasoning is of course the fact that it's because they have to pay the celestial tribute. And so it seems like even from such a a young age, Kaido was introduced to this notion that if you're not someone who has power, you don't get to control your own life. Which really is an idea that sounds quite familiar actually, if you're not strong, you don't have freedom. And then also with the fact that his own country, his own kingdom traded him away, this seems to fit quite nicely and you know aligns with another comment that Kaido has made in the past when he told Yamato that no one will ever accept Yamato or that no human will ever truly accept Yamato given the fact that they are Onis. And so it seems very likely that this moment here where his kingdom decided that they were going to trade him and really abandon him because they couldn't control him, it seems very likely that this experience has at least had a part in shaping that view. And before we move on to the next part of Kaido's life, I just want to take a little bit of time to mention some really cool details that could potentially connect and could potentially have been a clue about the vodka kingdom but were given to us you know earlier in the series so if we take a look at the last reverie one of the kingdoms that were in attendance was the Rushwan kingdom the rush one the rush one kingdom and more specifically, it was King Beer the Sixth of the Roshan Kingdom and his princesses. And now based on some of the details that we were given during the Reverie arc, it seems like that the Roshan Kingdom might be based on Russia. And this was indicated quite heavily actually through the Matrio princesses. And the Matrio princesses and their design is very much a stark reflection of the Matryoshka dolls which originate from Russia. Also, it just so happens that beer is is a very very popular drink in Russia but of course if we're talking alcohol and Russia the first alcohol that comes to mind is obviously vodka so it is possible that maybe there's a connection there between the vodka kingdom to the Rochuan kingdom you know either that the vodka kingdom actually changed their name after trading Kaido after they gained a seat at the reverie maybe their status as a kingdom elevated to the point that they felt it was necessary to change their name or maybe Maybe they're just two kingdoms that have a very close relationship. Either way, I thought it was a very, very peculiar coincidence, if it is a coincidence, which we often know that is not the case in One Piece. And so again, it really does have me thinking that there is actually a lot more to the earlier portion of Kaido's childhood that Oda hasn't actually fully explored yet, and we are actually still waiting for some more. But anyways, moving on, we see that Kaido has actually escaped and so we can at least tick off two out of the 18 times that he's been captured throughout his lifetime. Maybe even more if that's how he got to Vodka Kingdom in the first place, if he was actually a prisoner or if he was actually captured into Vodka Kingdom. In any case, a detail which did really stick out to me was his bounty. The fact that at such a young age, the first bounty that he received was 70 million berries. And now that's a huge bounty when you think about it, especially when you think about the fact that this was Kaido's first bounty and this is something that was most likely given to him just for his sheer strength alone. Up until this point, apart from the fact that he had escaped the clutches of the world government, he wouldn't have had a chance to do something necessarily against the world government or to threaten the world government in any way by that point. You know, apart from maybe just the odd damage that was done to some of the marine ships during his escape. I mean, clearly up until this point, he had been working for the Vodka Kingdom. And given that it seemed like Vodka Kingdom ranked pretty low in terms of the status of different kingdoms in the world, I find it very, very unlikely that Vodka Kingdom 
kingdom would have antagonized the world government at any point. And so really, based on the details that we do have, this whopping bounty would have only been given to Kaido just as a reflection of his threat because of his strength alone. And really, that's huge. I think it really does give you a real clear indication of just how strong he was even from such a young age. And this naturally then leads us to the next stage of Kaido's life that we're privy to, which is 44 years ago, which makes Kaido 15. And we've already known that Kaido joined the Rocks Pirates when he was 15 years old, which is something that we see during the flashback in chapter 1049, as well as being told of Rox's defeat. And in that sense, this part of the flashback doesn't actually add or tell us a whole lot. You know, we don't actually see what happened at God Valley, which I imagine is something that we were all very excited for and we were very much anticipating from Kaido's flashback. But nonetheless, we do get some other pieces of information, such as the fact that Rox actually sought out Kaido himself, or at least through Whitebeard, which again points to Kaido's really impressive strength. And it's also confirmed that Kaido was present at God Valley, or at the least that someone told him to, you know, come join in in this great battle. And now I suppose a good question is, who indeed was that silhouette that we saw? Because personally, I have to say that I am inclined to say that that was Charlotte Linlin and that hat that hat is actually a cowboy hat that we have seen Lin Lin wear in the past, as well as that cloak. Although I suppose it could be Rox and the straw hat, as some other people are supposing. Although if it was the latter, and it was indeed Rox that we saw in that silhouette, I do feel like that recognizing the straw hat, you know, as something that was once donned by his captain is something that Kaido should have mentioned. But then again, not recognizing the straw hat or at least not pointing it out is a point of curiosity that has come out at several other points in this series before. So I suppose it is a detail that can be just swept under the rug. I mean, in any case, like I said, I thought that was Lin Lin, but you know, who knows? Maybe it was Rogs. I mean, and who did you think it was? You know, I would be interested in hearing your thoughts on this. So let me know by leaving a comment below. But speaking of Lin Lin, this portion of the flashback is something that I actually appreciated quite a bit because I felt like it really fleshed out the relationship between Kaido and Big Mom a little further. Further. And from this portion of the flashback, you really get the sense that Lin Lin actually really did care for Kaido, you know, almost like a little brother, younger brother. And it seems like maybe she had even envisioned them to start their own crew one day. But I quite enjoyed this moment because seeing Kaido's flashback, especially his younger childhood days, I felt like you could make quite a few parallels to Big Mom and her childhood. I mean, we see that from a very young age, both Kaido and Big Mom never quite fit in, they were much larger, they were much stronger than their peers. And it was also to the extent that for this very reason, both of them were abandoned at a very young age. You know, obviously Big Mom by her parents, and then Kaido from his kingdom. And so I don't know whether these parallels or these sort of similarities are going to have a greater payoff or some significance further on in the story, but I do appreciate Oda, you know, fleshing this out a little bit more and giving us these details, because it sort of explains the close relationship that at least Kaido and Lin Lin seem to have within the Rocks Pirates, given the fact that the Rocks Pirates were notorious for their infighting and never really getting along. And so for me, it seemed to explain why these two at least had what seemed to be a better relationship. Anyways, moving on, the next part of Kaido's life that we know about is something that was obviously skipped in chapter 1049, but a detail that we are already privy to is how the next part of Kaido's life, or that the next part of Kaido's life, at least to our best knowledge, is Kaido breaking King out of world government captivity. And for me, this is really where it starts to get very interesting, where we start to see how the experiences that he went through as a young child during his formative years, how these have shaped his worldview and his ideologies, the ideologies that seems to be so ingrained in his character, this idea of, you know, the survival of the fittest. Because we see in chapter 1035 that Kaido harbored dreams of changing the world. And we actually see that he was a very brightly grinning individual who harbored these grand dreams, which is, you know, not not completely unlike our main character Luffy. But then of course, Kaido has this 
dark streak. And of course, Kaido's idea of changing the world is extremely different. And we actually see this in the last flashback in chapter 1049, where we see that Kaido by now is extremely jaded. We see that he is in complete agreement with Kurozomi Higurashi about, about the type of world that they live in. And this seems to be the moment that he was convinced to go to Wano to set up a weapons factory, to set up a complete weapons manufacturing nation. And apart from raising some really burning questions like, how did that Kurozumi woman make it out of Wano? I mean, what is her story? But really, the reason why this part of the flashback was so interesting for me was because it actually really shifted my reading of the flashback that we saw in chapter 1035. Back then, when I initially read that chapter and when I initially saw that flashback, I saw Kaido as almost this bright, hopeful man. You know, someone who could change the world to get rid of the world government who would do terrible things like torture children or, you know, conduct experiments on children. I thought this was a Kaido who saw himself as Joy Boy and who also saw himself as like a savior and who would do great things in the world. But now after reading chapter 1049, the way that I read Kaido as a character and his character journey, his character arc has changed quite a bit. Now I understand that the change he envisioned in bringing to the world was destroying and solely destroying status. You know, his dialogue that one's worth, one's value can only be gauged in battle because on the battleground, everyone is equal. You know, there is an anarchy in terms of status. There is no such thing as status where someone can control another because simply you are strong or you are not. And you can really see how, as a result of his childhood, this is the conclusion that he has come to, that the fair and equal world is one that will just be measured by a test of strength. Because of the fact that he perceived his childhood as unfair because of the lowly ranking, the low status of his kingdom, this is his idea of freedom. And of course, for us, we can clearly see just how ironic his conclusion is. At the end of the day, Kaido has still become the oppressor. But what's even darker and more sinister is how he's even managed to pull King or Arbear into the darkness. I mean, I imagine it was around this same time Time that the conversation that we saw back in chapter 1036 occurred. You know, a conversation between King and a typically drunk or at least drinking Kaido, whether King still thought that Kaido was Joy Boy and whether this world that Kaido is creating is the world that King envisioned. And of course, King replies that he doesn't care anymore and that, you know, he just confirms his true devotion and loyalty to Kaido. And I think this is actually a good time to note that I did some research, actually, and Roshan means in both both Persian and Sanskrit, Roshan or Roshan actually means bright light or brightness. And you know, going back to the connection that we made before about the big king, the sixth, coming from Roshwan, and the connections that could potentially be made between the Roshwan kingdom and the Vodka kingdom. And I don't know, maybe I'm reading way too much into it, but I think it's quite interesting that Kaido now seems to embody the darkness and the country that he may or may not have originally originated from embodies the light. Anyways, this conversation with Higurashi occurred 36 years ago, and obviously we know through Odin's flashback that Kaido did indeed go to Wano, and we know the rest of the story from there. But then another detail that we get in chapter 1049 occurs after Odin's death, and we see that the topic or this figure of Joy Boy has again come up for King and Kaido, this time because the illustrious figure has been brought up by Yamato to Kaido, and Yamato told Kaido that Joy Boy will be coming to Wano. And by now, Kaido is a truly hardened, depressed drunkard. You know, he's very set in his way about changing and challenging the world with just his might. But then this exchange that we see with King in chapter 1049 is really intriguing because of Kaido's dialogue. When Kaido tells King that he knows who Joy Boy is because Joy Boy is the one that's going to defeat him. And I found this really, really intriguing because it fits and aligns quite well with some of the other dialogues and some of the very interesting things that he said in the past. For example, and probably most importantly, when he told Yamato that the reason he is at Wano or the reason why he can't leave Wano is because it is Wano. You know, perhaps he was saying that he has to stay at Wano because he has to meet Joy Boy. 
because after reading the conversation between Kaido and King, I start to look at Kaido's life and retrospectively, it's almost as if the way in which Kaido is now changing or challenging the world and challenging fate and circumstances is all purely for the reason to meet Joy Boy. After having endured the experiences that he went through, Kaido's obviously become very disillusioned with the world, a world that he lives in where, you know, people with power people in high places, people with high status are the ones in control and this has obviously shaped his worldview into believing that in order to not come under the control of anyone else, you just have to have that physical strength. And although this formed much of his ideology, but then after hearing about the tales of Joy Boy, about who Joy Boy is, about his nature, about what he's supposed to do, I think Kaido was enticed with this idea of another figure who could come to challenge the world and flip the world on its head. This figure who would challenge the status quo, but in a different way and in a way without oppressing any others like Kaido has. And I think Kaido is actually very excited about the prospect about a figure who will change the world and really bring true liberation. And I think this is why Kaido has been so depressed and why he's been so determined to die about how he wasn't able to jewel it out with Whitebeard or about how he hasn't able to find a proper, a suitable way to die or someone strong enough to defeat him because I think he's actually been really disappointed in himself and the world for not proving that his way is wrong. It's almost as if Kaido knows that he's wrong and he just wants the world to prove that for him. You know, but obviously until he's able to find that figure who is strong enough to prove him wrong, he's just going down this extremely distressing destructive path, one that's destructive, you know, for everyone else that he's oppressed, but also quite destructive for him for himself. And this really seems to align with other dialogue that we've seen from Kaido in the past, you know, such as the comment that he made to Yamato when Yamato asked Kaido why Kaido won't leave Wano alone, why Kaido, you know, won't give Wano its freedom, why he won't give Yamato freedom. And Kaido answered that these aren't simple questions with simple answers. And I think that's a lesson or an idea that he has fixated in his head. He knows that the status quo has to be challenged and that the world has to be changed, but the only way he knows how is through this idea of survival of the fittest, even though he knows it isn't necessarily the right answer. And I think this could be why Kaido is so desperate to meet someone who will be strong enough to defeat him and prove him wrong and bring about a world, bring about the new world that he and both him and King, both him and Arba, initially wished to see and probably still now deep down the world that they still wish to see. And if this is the case, this could even explain why Kaido went to Marineford. Maybe Kaido once believed that Ace was the one who was supposed to beat him. And you know, especially if we think that Yamato had been singing Ace's praises and also the fact that Ace went to the extent of, you know, destroying that dragon statue. Maybe Kaido thought that Ace may have been the real deal and he wanted to test it out for himself, but then Obviously, Shanks being the wiser, Shanks told Kaido that Ace, Ace wasn't that individual and that he was too early and maybe that's why he turned back. I mean, maybe, but maybe not. I suppose this is another, you know, detail or another part of Kaido's story that we are just going to have to see whether Oda is going to flesh out a little longer, a little more, and whether we're going to see all of these questions, unresolved parts and portions of Kaido's story actually fleshed out. And I suppose this then brings us to an interesting question as to whether you think that we do actually indeed need more in the way of, you know, an extended flashback or backstory for Kaido. I mean, as we have established throughout this discussion, there are obviously lots of bits and pieces that have just been glossed over and we haven't gotten the full extent of the details yet. But then again, I feel like we have also established that when you actually sit down, take the time to put the pieces together and see all the different, you know, parts of his flashback that we have seen throughout this arc, it actually does paint a picture so that we can understand Kaido as a character and, you know, understand Kaido and his motivations. But then, of course, in saying all that, I am an absolute glutton for backstory and flashbacks. So personally, as much as I enjoyed, you know, this little dive in unpacking and then 
re-chronologically packing Kaido's backstory together. I would really like to see more of his flashbacks. But then I'm also interested in hearing your thoughts about it. You know, do you guys feel like we have enough of Kaido's backstory? Do you feel like we need more? Do you think we're going to get more? And also, what do you guys think about the way that I have interpreted what we have of Kaido's backstory? You know, let me know all of these things by leaving a comment below. Don't forget to like and share the video. Again, please also subscribe to the channel if you haven't already because we do have yet again another break week but obviously these will go much easier if you are subscribed to this channel. Also, you can join our Joy Fleet Discord server or even become a Patreon member. And I do want to thank all our patrons for help supporting the channel. This is Joy Girl and I'll see you again soon.